was about three years into my career as a civil rights lawyer when I got a call one day from a waiter, and he said to me that his manager was taking a share of his tips. And wasn't there something wrong with that? And I said, hmm, that's an interesting question. Let me, let me do a little research and I'll get back to you. So I went to the law books and I found this law in the books in the state of Massachusetts, this law that was written in 1952, and it turned out that there, were, there was really no case law on it. It was a little general, but I looked at the law and I thought, yeah, you know, I think this law says that managers can't take tips. It turned out that there was this whole problem endemic through the industry that employers were using waitstaff's tips and funneling them to pay all of their other costs, to pay their managers, to pay their, their back of the house staff, to pay for the building repairs, and to line their own pocket. That first case, it was against a fancy restaurant. It didn't go so well. So I took another case, and another case also, it, it didn't go so well. Um, but by that time, I had talked to so many waiters, and I had taken on so many of these cases, and, and before I knew it, I had more than a dozen of these cases where I was challenging employers for not letting their wait staff keep all of their tips or service charges. And before I knew it, I had really built up a body of case law here in Massachusetts that said that tips are for wait staff, managers can't share in tip pools, service charges and gratuities that are added to bills for food and beverage have to go to the wait staff. They can't be used, they can't go to the employer, they can't go to managers, they can't go to anyone else. I took a case in Florida against a hotel, against a chain of hotels, and there, was, there is no statute, and it wasn't until just a couple weeks ago I actually finally got in front of a judge to make the argument about why it should be illegal under the common law, even though there's no statute, but under the common law it's just deceptive for a hotel to add a service charge to a banquet bill, 20% service charge, uh, but then the wait staff don't get it. And the customers are paying what they think looks like a pretty generous gratuity, and of course they're not going to tip any more on top of it, or you know, maybe occasionally or rarely a customer will go out of their way to tip beyond it, but, but the wait staff aren't getting tips because the customers think they are, already are getting tips. So I went to this hearing a couple weeks ago in Florida, and the, the defense lawyer, was, he was kind of droning on and on about, well, there's no statute here in Florida, and he was kind of droning on about the elements of tortious interference with advantageous relations, and the judge's eyes were kind of glazing over. And, and then I get up there and I say my piece, and I, and I explain what's going on here. Look, these wait staff, they're working hard, they're carrying these ice buckets, they're making the tables pretty, the customers are appreciative, but they think they're already getting tipped, but they really aren't. And, and I realized that what the judge really wanted to talk about was, um, was his daughter's wedding. <laughs> so we talked about his daughter's wedding, and, and he told me about how, yeah, you know, there was this 20% service charge on the bill, and I, I, so I thought the waiters were tipped, but were they not really tipped? I thought it was going to them. Should I, should I have given them another tip? And, <laughs> and, I, I, and I, said, I said, exactly, that's the point. The employer thinks that you're confused about that, and the reason you're willing to pay this is because you kind of think it's going to the waiters, but you're not so sure, but you haven't ever really asked. Uh, and, and, you know, and the next thing you know, the judge is asking me, what's, what's up with those hotel resort fees? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, what's up with those hotel resort fees? It's, it's, this, it's the same thing. You don't really know what you're paying for, and you're kind of too polite to ask. Uh, and so I, I won that hearing. The case allowed, the judge allowed the case to go forward, even though there's no statute in Florida. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think the point, the lesson to be learned there is that, is that once people hear about it, know about it, and understand the scam, and, and are willing to ask the questions, uh, they're really angry. They're really angry that employers are really profiting off of this misunderstanding that, that, that people think that the money is going in the worker's pocket when it's not. So um, I've, done, I've done these cases for, uh, for waiters, and, and it's endemic, it turns out, through the hospitality industry, through the service industry. It's not just waiters. I now represent strippers. And uh, <laughs> it's, 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 the same thing. it's the same thing with strippers. They, they don't get to keep all those tips, um, but they should. And, and there's a law about that. Um, tour guide operators, 
Um, and in, in 2006, I got a call from an airline skycap. Uh, and he explained to me what the airlines had just started doing. They had, they had added a charge for curbside check-in, um, a $2 per bag charge. And before that, the skycaps who've worked decades, many of them, had made their living off of tips from passengers. Uh, when people go to the airport to take a flight uh, and they don't want to wait in those long lines in the airport, they'll get checked in by the skycap and, and customarily they'll pay a dollar, two dollars per bag and a tip for the skycaps. Uh, and then one day the airlines realized that this money was changing hands, all this cash was being paid from the passengers right to the workers and the airlines weren't getting a piece of it. So they came in and they started charging two dollars per bag for curbside check-in. And the skycaps told me about how this just devastated them. They weren't making any money, people weren't tipping beyond the $2. Most people thought the $2 was still going to them. They'd say, oh, here you go, here's your $2. Uh, but it wasn't the same $2 that it used to be because it went into the coffers of the airline. While the trial was going on, I was getting calls and emails from people around the country saying, oh my god, those $2 per bag charges, I thought that was going to the sky caps. You mean I wasn't tipping them? And I said, yeah, that's, that's the point. And, and the jury saw the point, too. And we won the case. And it was... <clears throat> and it was, it, was, it was just so gratifying that, that shortly after we had that trial in 2008, most of the airlines across the country dropped their $2 per bag charge. So I ask you to ask these questions, too. The next time you go to a restaurant and you're filling out the bill, if you're planning a party or hosting a wedding, if you are ordering room service from your room service server, if you're getting behind a cab, ask these questions. Employers, ask, ask is, is the waiter getting the whole tip or is some of it going to pay the manager? Is the service charge that was put on the bill, you know, question it. If you plan a party, you plan a banquet, what is this charge for? Is that going to the workers? And maybe if it's not going to the workers, you say, well, I don't want to pay it. Because employers are profiting off of this misunderstanding, off of people wanting to politely pay the bill and not ask these questions. But think about how powerful it could be if around the country, even around the world, more people started asking these questions. And I think the impact that could have could be profound. Thank you.